I am thrilled to have David Taylor, owner of Machine Tool Spares in Coventry, England. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks very much. It's uh, great to eventually get to talk to you guys. Yeah, yeah. We've we've been uh, bugging you, trying to get you to be on the show for a while. So let's hope this all pays off. Um, I'm sure it will. So first, David, um, I just want you to explain your company a bit for all our listeners out there and um, and then get your story how you got into this business. Then we'll, we'll grill you on all kinds of other things. Okay. Uh, Machine Tool Spares um, is a company that specializes in classic Wickman multi-spindle uh, lathes. We do we provide a one-stop service shop for, for those machines. We supply spare parts all over the world. We service the machines. We buy and sell the machines. We do process engineering, turnkey packages. We train people in setting and in maintenance on the machines. And uh, we love them. Okay. We love these machines. And uh, we want to carry on to make sure that they stay relevant in, in the modern world. Right. Right. So, you know, a lot of our customers, um, listeners out there are pretty savvy to Wickman's, but for people that aren't Wickman, um, multi-spindle screw machine, been around since, since when? The, the since 50s? the 50s. Since the 50s. Okay. And we know David mainly because... Um, for our spare parts business, we buy our spare parts for Wickman from him. Um, but you do a lot more than that. You're saying you turn key machines for people. Um, you yeah, we, people. we 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 uh, we do quite a few turnkey packages. We're very excited by projects where we're actually stretching the boundaries of these machines, doing some stuff that uh, that hasn't been done before, despite the fact that the, the machines are 60, 70 years old. Yeah, it is an incredible thing um, how these mechanical machines can stay relevant, whereas a CNC machine that's, you know, 10, 15 years old becomes irrelevant um yeah so okay wickman also exists in england in coventry um and so you are the you know the independent alternative to wickman would you say that's that's kind of the case and what other services do you provide do you provide services that they wouldn't uh, I, I don't know whether we would provide anything that they wouldn't provide, but we are the independent alternative. We uh, pride ourselves in uh, being uh, a, a nice, easy company to do business with, with having a huge range of spare parts and um, having some of the most skilled guys in the world uh, within the team we have that uh, that can help people um, ensure that they're producing efficiently and uh, can can solve problems if they have them with the machines and uh, and fix things so that people are up and running focusing on on you know, we're focused on making sure our clients have got good uptime okay and your clients are where are they mostly in England or are they all over the world? We supply people internationally. Um, so be it in, in South America, we obviously deal with you guys uh, in North America. Um, we're dealing all over Europe, in Asia. Uh, and so we've got a pretty, pretty big reach. Okay. Um, do you have any questions, Dad? Uh, I'd like to know what's left of the screw machine business in uh, the UK? The There's multi, the multi spindle business. Yeah, and how it's, it's been transformed. It's declining Lloyd and, and it's, a, it's a very sad thing that it's declining. We are 
trying to ensure the machines stay relevant and that people continue to use them to produce parts. The principal, one of the principal reasons that uh, people are not choosing to continue to, to run some of these machines is because they cannot get skilled labor to set the machines. Um, I think that uh, you know, the fact that that apprenticeships stopped on mass um, 20, 30 years ago, and so you didn't have the flow of young people coming through with the skills, coupled with the fact that that on a just in time uh, single piece flow system, the the time to set these machines often puts people off um, putting parts on them. So uh, there is a combination of, of reasons, but there is a steady decline in the use of these machines in the UK. Uh, fortunately, um, we don't see that in some other parts of the world. And we are continually trying to encourage people to actually take up the use of these machines and offering training services and, and, and turnkey packages is part of uh, making life easier for people to continue to use them and to take them up. Okay. Where do, where do you find growth? We're finding growth um, in uh, some some new markets for us. We're finding growth in India at the moment, and um, we're finding some growth in continental Europe and um, in, in Scandinavian countries. Uh, but you know, it's it's not dramatic within the European um, envelope, uh, but. You know, we actually have to go out there and try and, and fight for market share and fight to, um, to, to keep the machines being used. One thing that strikes me when we're trying to set up a machine for a client is the length of time to get tooling. Do you, does that make any sense to you these days that... Uh, tooling should take that long to, uh, specialized tooling should take that long to get? It shouldn't. And um, we work with uh, a small number of tooling suppliers who've got pretty good turnaround times. Um, but, uh, you know, I think to some extent it depends on the sophistication of the client and um, of the user of the machines. And if, they've, if they're using CAD, then they should be able to have CAD files of parts that tool makers can take, uh, take the, the, the dimensions from to be able to produce tooling pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm stunned like uh, setting up thread chasing and right. how long it takes for us to get uh, thread chasers made, the actual cutting tool. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that to be there the case in England? We would we would be looking to get a a, a chasing tool made in a week. Really? And yeah. how long does it take for us? A couple of weeks? No, longer. Um, it seems, and uh, you know, and then there's the delay of uh, the coatings. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think. It's it's clearly an issue in terms of developing parts because um, unlike a CNC machine where where you can develop a part, you can change an offset or move a tool slightly, we can't with these machines, and we're we're having tools modified. Um, it it has led. Uh, to us doing turnkeys for people rather than supplying machines and then setting up in a production shop because it's disruptive. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an area of the business that we've tried to work with our clients to make sure that as soon as the machine hits their shop floor, they can be producing rather than having to go through that development cycle. How often are you turnkeying machines versus just uh, find a good machine and 
kick it and kiss it as we would say and and spin it off or do you not do that do you only we're, we're doing a, a lot less of that um because you we're need to do the much... value added yeah and we're, we're doing so we we're, we're doing much more in terms of turnkey and we're doing uh more extensive overhauls rebuilds mm -hmm. is that because the equipment is damaged is that because they're new customers no. It's because the customers that we're dealing with want to have a machine they've got a high level of confidence in right. and that they know they can they can leave producing reliably and, and consistent parts um, for demanding customers. I think that's the other side of it. They're more demanding. Yeah. yeah, their customers have got stronger, tighter quality systems in place. And so they have to have the confidence that the machines are consistent. So we're doing, you know, everything that goes out of here now virtually goes out having been through test cuts. And, and so people have an understanding we're doing rebuilds and we're changing spindle bearings more often than not, etc. But isn't it astonishing to buy a used machine that has been running and making viable parts theoretically and finding how bad that is? Yeah, it is amazing. Lloyd, we, we get machines in and we start taking them apart and you do wonder how this bit of kit has made good parts, but that's part of the, the, the fascination of the machines. They are so robust. Mm -hmm. that yes, they can continue to produce. Right. And the longevity is, 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 is part of the reason we love them. Yeah, they're forgiving. And, yeah. Uh, uh, and customers are, are versatile. Customers are clever, or, or yeah. users are clever in yeah. adapting to the weaknesses of uh, their aged machines. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, which keeps the spare parts business going. Which is obviously uh, good for us both. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you, uh, in, in selling to India, uh, we find buyers in India are virtually totally focused on price. Do you find the same? Or it is a major more sophisticated and asking for better quality. It's a major uh, purchasing factor. Um, I am finding that people are moving up in terms of their expectation and the, um, uh, no, I, I, you, you'll kick it and kiss it or lick it, whichever it was, yeah. phrase, they, 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 they're, they're, not, they're not accepting machines like that anymore. And really? so, yeah. We are, we are looking now at providing machines, again, that we've been through, we've overhauled them, we've done test cuts on them. They don't want them painted um, because they can do that much more cost effectively themselves. But mechanically, they want to know that they're in good condition. And, um, you know, I, I think that for the longevity of the market in these machines, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my impression always has been they're, they're a fix-it culture. So, you know, I mean, if, if a car breaks down in a third world country, they're not afraid to go and operate on it. Um, whereas we, we just yeah. throw it away. So my impression is they'll take a machine that's, not great and they're okay with that either because they don't need the quality or because they feel like they'll they'll be able to deal with it um they, they, you're, they you're certainly, finding they have a much higher standard now i find they have a higher standard however they will still um repair things and fix things and 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 make it work 
um, and they're not looking for service engineers to to go out and solve small problems okay. for them. Okay. Um, but we did a, a turnkey last year that, that went out to India where um, a, a client came to us with quite an unusual uh, request and we went through and developed a process to be able to produce the parts that, that they were looking, uh, looking to supply. Can you tell us um, what the request was or is that top secret? Um, it was, it was machining a forged, uh, a forged component. Okay. So we developed a loading system, um, ejection system. We had to, uh, work on how we maintained all the tolerances. Yeah. That, um, that's one given, of the, the loading systems. That's one of the hairiest processes, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and so you know, and and we were very concerned about the safety of this machine mm. um, in terms of operation. So we, we we ensured that we put in a safe operating system on it as well, um, uh, and it took us a bit of time to develop, but it went out and is is producing parts now. Um, so so where there's something that's a little unusual. Um, or something that's uh, perhaps a little more complicated, then yes, people across the board, whether it be in, in the Indian market or whether it be in the European market, they're looking for, clients are looking for assistance with that. Um, but, but in the Indian market, they're certainly not looking for, in, in my experience now, they're not looking just to buy in any old machine and get it going. Interesting. Can, are, are you shocked about the, say, the companies in Germany that are consistently buying new index multis for uh, a million, pa a million uh, euro each? Well, they're getting a lot, a lot incentive on it. Well, we would pay a million. They're probably paying 600,000. But still, you know. Right. Um, do you think that, it, that the, the value is there? It all depends on, on the work they're putting on the machines, Lloyd. We, I, I've been into shops where they've got index multi-spindles and they're producing components that you could produce on uh, a classic Wickman machine. Um, I do not understand the economics in that situation at all. Um, if you're moving stuff from sliding head machines uh, onto index multi spindles because the volume is there, then I understand it. Right, um, right. But but not simple parts. Mm -hmm. And you know, Germany has a very high proportion of their GDP is generated through manufacturing, much higher than in the UK and, and in the US. And you know, they, they clearly um, have high levels of productivity and are very good at developing and producing, you know, uh, components and parts and assemblies that people in the world want to buy. I think they're, um, they're very loyal. They're, they're sort of a nationalist loyal to their domestic products, too. That always strikes yeah. me yeah I'm but, uh, but but no i i can't see i can't see the value for certain components but for others yes so yeah so i i think it's a, a very sort of mixed mixed um mixed view in my my that i see uh that indexes and they're like um, a wonderful machines. I've got a, I've, I've got a strong place in the uh, manufacturing environment going forward, but so have simple cam mm -hmm. automated uh, screw machines because they are in brilliantly efficient at producing the right part and they are really good value for money. 
Do you do you put any CNC stuff on retrofit on your machines? CNC slides or no, no, we don't. Um, what we have done, it, what we will do for clients is develop special purpose attachments if there isn't anything available in the market. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, curious um, that you have started a citizen shop that uh, uh, y where you're running machines. Mm -hmm. and, you, you have your own shop, your own production shop? Uh, not within machine tool spares at all. Right, right. Um, I have, uh, a, 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 I've got a, a share in another business. Okay. Um, which is a machine shop, and uh, we run citizens in that machine shop. Oh, that's interesting. Um, very different volumes. Uh, they're not, we don't run the volumes that you'd want to put on a, a multi-spindle screw machine. Um, and we run uh, parts with levels of complexity that would be very difficult to produce on, uh, on a multi-spindle uh, Wickman. No. Where, how did you get into this business? Have you run production before in the past, before you became the owner of Machine Tool Spares? Uh, my background um, is that I, I got involved in um, small manufacturing uh, back in 89. Um, my family uh, had three businesses at that point. Um, to one of which had lost uh, or lost its major customer. It was a plastic injection molding company. Uh, a second one, um, the guy who was running that business was 64 and a half years old and we had no succession in place. And so I came back to Coventry to get involved in those two businesses to see if I could help one survive and provide some succession in the second. And, um, and have stayed. I was going to stay for three years, and you know, thirty years on, I'm still here. I'm uh, wondering now. You do a fair amount of business in India now. Um, there hasn't been much Whitman business in China. Do you have you sold much in China? No, we haven't. Mm -hmm. Um, I've sold some parts, but no machines. Is that because they don't want to bring in used equipment? Uh, or they're it's not, not proficient? A, it's not a market that we have pursued. Um, uh, there are uh, various issues, um, obviously, with, with trying to crack that market and, and sell machinery to them. And it's something that, uh, as I say, we've not pursued. Um, as it is, it is clearly a growing market, and I'm aware that uh, there are more of my type of machine in that marketplace now than there have been historically. Um, but there's, you've got to put a lot of resource into getting down and trying to actually develop a presence there, and it's something that. Um, we are probably not going to be looking at in the near term. Is England one of your main markets or, or France and Germany you sell more machines in? Um, it's, it's very, uh, it's quite even, Noah. You know, okay, we, so, so England, does have, England does have, England does have, they're, they're still running their wick pins in England. They're still, some people are still running these machines and some people are still buying them. Um, uh, and you know, we're getting, we're, we're, we're getting inquiries for again, refurbished machines. Right. Right. So people who perhaps have run the machines and their machines are quite old and tired and yet they don't want to move away from them because they understand the economic benefit of them. Mm -hmm. So they're coming along and they're looking for 
a, a, a good refurbished machine. We're finding people who, again, have got more complicated things to do on them that they, they can't do themselves coming along and asking us to develop processes for them. Okay, what are the prices like? You don't have to tell us. I, I'm just curious. Oh, I, would, I don't really want to go into that. That's fine. That's fine. So tell us about uh, how you view uh, the Brexit and how you think it is affecting you or will affect you. It's the UK is now out of Europe. Uh, we have left, but nothing has changed because we're, we now have a transition period through to the end of this year. Depending on what is negotiated during that period, very little could change or everything could change. If we come out at the end of this year without a deal with the European Union, then there, there will be significant ramifications. The, the, the supply chains are complicated. I'll give you one example. Nissan have a car plant in Sunderland. In, in the northeast of England. N Nissan? Nissan. Nissan. Okay. Um, it is, it, it, it historically has been one of the most productive car plants in the whole of Europe. Nissan hold half a day of stock at that plant. They use five million parts per day. 60% of which are imported. If uh, we come out, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're crazy numbers. And if we come out and we don't have alignment and we have customs checks and we have more paperwork, then A, it will mean that they will have to hold far more stock. And B, for future investment decisions, yeah. Nissan will look at that and say, do we want to be producing in England or do we want to be producing in Europe? So I think fundamentally it has the potential to, to, to be very serious unless we get a deal. Europe has been doing trade deals since it was set up, since the UK joined the European Union 40 years ago, we have not had to negotiate a trade deal. So we are now going into a negotiation with experts on the other side of the table and we're coming in pretty cold. Ah. I, I, you know, I have a lot of fear about what might happen. Interesting. If we can get a deal, great. But I, I'm, not, I'm not confident. I hope that our new government and their, uh, their, their confidence comes through. The other thing that's happened with Brexit, which is real and has happened uh, you know, over the last three years, since we voted to leave in 2016 to today, sterling um, has depreciated something like 10% against the euro, 11% against the dollar. I know it's going back up at the moment and there's a little bounce, but it's still 10% down. Yeah, since, since, you know, prior to the referendum. And that has made it's, it's made our goods cheaper to export. So hopefully that's had a, a, a positive impact. But it's also made our imports more expensive. And we, we import a lot of product that goes into final assemblies, like that Nissan example, 60% of their parts are imported. So there's a bit of a balance going on there. Um, 
but overall, you know, we sit and wait and um, we hope that a deal can be done because tariffs, red tape and regulation will damage the UK manufacturing economy. economy. Yeah. So do you have a plan B? <laughs> is, the, is the Swiss company the plan B? Or is that uh, more at risk? Uh, the, 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 my, my major competitor is very close geographically to where I am. Mm -hmm. And we face, we will be facing similar problems. Um, if, uh, there is a, 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 if it, if the issues are significant, then, uh, we will establish, uh, a facility in continental Europe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that, that will be something that we would have to be faced with quite significant um, difficulties in being able to supply that part of the market. Would that be difficult uh, uh, to do? Sorry? Would that be difficult to do, to move your business to? It, I wouldn't move certain aspects of it. So our machine rebuilding, we wouldn't move at all because we've got skilled men here. Mm -hmm. um, our supply of parts, uh, we could set up a stock holding uh, facility in, in Europe quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we can effectively put stock into that facility on a, on a quasi consignment basis and replenish as it's being sold um, if we needed to. I don't. I, I hope and I don't think we'll get to that position, but uh, we have considered it and uh, that will be our response. There has been, in the financial industry, quite a bit of movement to Ireland, hasn't there? There has, um, and London is still the financial capital of Europe, and um, there are uh, there's posturing going on between the UK government and the European negotiator at the moment over financial services. Um, there's within that market, there's an awful lot of value in having a critical mass, which London has, which New York has, um, you know, and to move that uh, away from London will be quite difficult and take quite some time. Um, uh, various other European capitals and major cities would love to, uh, to get a slice of the uh, financial services market, which, which exists in London. And they will, they will try hard and their governments and, and country representatives will try to facilitate that for them. But um, uh, London's in a pretty strong, strong position, I think. Um, one thing that has intrigued me in one of our previous conversations, you told me that your son is uh, not in the machine tool array, uh, but is basically a, a math whiz and um, is in the business of calculating odds. Is that correct? For for soccer or mainly or? It's mainly know, soccer. It's mainly soccer now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he he has a um, a, as he would regard it, a dream job in many ways. He gets to watch a lot of football <laughs> and gets paid for it, and and also gets to exercise his other passion, which is playing around with numbers. Hmm. So uh, yeah, he he's he's a lucky lucky young man that he's found a niche uh, a niche position that he thoroughly enjoys. So he does sort of sabermetrics, but for soccer, and then 
uh, advises betters? Is that kind of what he does? Or? It's, that, it's, you, you, that's the sort of thing that they do, yeah. Very interesting. And who would have thought that sort of job would have existed? Yes, that uh, in 1989. Indeed, not. <laughs> indeed not. Uh, so, as you look back on your career, I'm curious, uh, how much do you think uh, luck has uh, changed the course of your life? Um, I, I think you make your own luck. Mm -hmm. I think that um, hard work is, is the principal driver and making sure that, you know, if you are faced with a set of circumstances that you make the best of those circumstances and that if it's somewhere you don't want to be, then you should move. Um, uh, I clearly have been fortunate uh, uh, at certain points. I've had good fortune in meeting certain people at certain points. I've had good fortune in um, being able to work with, uh, with people who uh, are technically excellent and passionate about what they do. Um, but I, I, would, I, I wouldn't say that, my, that there's any one piece of, of luck that sort of changed uh, the direction uh, of, of my life. I think that um, it's, it's been down to making, uh, making a, a good fist and working hard at, at whatever's been placed in front of me or that I've gone and created. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you, David. It was, uh, it was good to, Guys, uh, to get to know you more in depth. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and um, I look forward to carrying on listening to Swarfcast. Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Have you have you listened to many to many shows? I've listened to a fair few, um, and uh, I find them you know interesting. I just think it's 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 nice to to listen to people talking about you know our industry yeah. and our world because um it's you know when i when i go for dinner with friends <laughs> i describe myself as the, as the dinosaur <laughs> because you know i'm i'm in a world that none of them understand they don't participate in it they're not in manufacturing they don't make parts uh -huh. and they certainly don't have the privilege of working with machines that are 30 40 50 years old right or the people who work on them that's a different mm -hmm. world for them i would imagine yeah Absolutely. People look at me like I'm from another planet when I tell them I, I sell machine tools. And then once in a while, there's an engineer at the table and they go, oh, yeah, I speak your language. <laughs> <laughs> but usually people go, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, it's down to us to continue to try and educate them, Noah.